Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Well, here we are, the Sunday before Christmas. The stockings are, are being hung. We're, we're continuing with our shopping and or wrapping, in my case, both. Meals are being planned, and no matter what you do or, or what's going on, it, it always seems to be a rather hectic time, which is so fitting that we get to look at this beautiful title given to our Messiah today. You see, we've been going through Isaiah 9, 6, and we've been looking at the wonderful wonderful titles and descriptions given to our Messiah, our Jesus. We've been looking at the fact that he's our wonderful counselor. He's our mighty God. He is our everlasting father. I mean, these are pretty powerful and descriptive words that are given to Jesus because these all signify more than just who he is, but it's what he does. And they seem to be building up to this final prince of peace, which is what we're going to look at today. You see, when peace seems so far from us, peace is there. When everything around us and we seem to be surrounded with chaos and storms, peace is near. Peace is near. You see, we can have that peace. So as we jump into this, what images come to your mind when you think of the word peace? I mean, there's a story that's told of a couple after their fifth child. They received a playpen from some friends. Several weeks later, the friends received a note, a thank you note, thanking them for what they'd done. The note went like this. The playpen is wonderful. Just what we needed. I sit in it every afternoon and read and the kids can't get close to me. You see, that is a way that we start to get peace. And the images of peace that really come to mind are, are, are the endings of wars or, or maybe peace to you is you remember a vacation at the beach where you saw the sun setting and it was just a peaceful time or a sleeping infant. There really isn't much, much more peaceful than a sleeping infant. These are all beautiful images and aspects of peace, but they are in no means or by no means everlasting. They all end. Unfortunately, wars begin again, the vacations do end, and that sleeping, peaceful infant eventually wakes up. So how is it possible that we can have peace? How can we have peace when it seems that it is gone and it is on vacation itself and it's so far away? Here's why. Because, see, our peace isn't dependent on circumstances. It really isn't. It's not dependent on the storms that may be enveloping or even the wonderful things that you're going through. That ultimately is not what peace is dependent on. See, our peace begins with a person, and that person is our Messiah. It's our Jesus. And so let's dive into what this word even means. The word prince in this instance means ruler. It means leader. It means official. It means captain. This is a big meaning for that word peace. And the word peace means such, so much more when you dive into it. it. It really is the word shalom. That word shalom signifies completeness. It signifies wholeness and, and soundness. It signifies welfare, safety. It ultimately signifies that you are with God in covenant relationship. One commentator said the word shalom is one of the most significant theological words we find in the Bible. It's much more than a simple greeting. And when you really get into it, this Prince of Peace means the one who removes all peace-disturbing factors and secures our peace. And it ultimately bring, means it's the Prince whose coming brings peace. This Messiah's coming brings peace. Remember, this prophecy given about our Messiah was given over 700 years before his birth. And not only that, the world situation was rather bleak. It was rather bleak when it was spoken. It was almost pretty bleak when, when he showed up with the Roman oppression. And see, that's why the prophet Isaiah said, look, this is a time of great darkness, but there will be a light that pierces through so this is who Jesus is. He is peace. Now, peace is something that people consistently try 
and try to attain. It's something that we all universally desire. It's something that we try and try to find in a myriad of different ways, from jobs, from financial security, that will bring you peace. Through relationships, you believe you'll have peace because of this person you're with. So many different ways people try to find peace and it actually can become rather deceptive. You see, we can try and try and try and control every area and facet of our lives, but it truly is not possible. Because there are times in our life, and I'm sure many of us have seen that, especially this past year, where things and events happen that are completely out of our control. It seems peace has fled the scene. Now that would be true if our peace were dependent on what happened. If it did, we would find ourselves often in a state of turmoil. I'm going to tell you this right now, is Jesus never intended for you, for anyone, for anything, to carry the weight and burden of peace in and of themselves. Only His shoulders are wide enough. Only His shoulders are broad enough to bring you and I peace. There's one reason why Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. And Jesus says, look, I will give you rest. This is what He's telling you. Don't you do it. Jesus says, look, take my yoke, take my way upon you. Let me teach you. Because I'm humble, I'm gentle at heart, and you will ultimately find rest for your souls. Because when I think of peace, I begin to think of a soul and a life and a person at rest. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's like, look, only I can bring you this peace. Why? Because he is the Prince of Peace. So what does this begin to mean for us today? Well, the first truth is our Messiah, our Jesus, restores what is broken between God and man. He restores what is broken. Because see, the, the people of, of the time of the birth of Christ, they were longing for a Messiah. They were longing for a Messiah who would bring earthly peace. They longed and longed for freedom from Roman oppression. But see, Jesus knows the peace that we really need. We can have earthly peace all over, but if we don't have peace with God, it literally does us absolutely no good. Paul writes this in Romans. He says in Romans 5, now in the first four chapters, Paul has gone over and over letting us know that we can't fully be justified with God through the law. And then he jumps into this verse in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, we have been made right in God's sight by faith. We have peace with God. This is us. We have this peace, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. We have peace and the only way we have it is because of what Jesus did. This is why this time, this is why we celebrate the birth of our Messiah and it's so beautiful and it's so important. We know, we know that this is the beginning of life, <laughs> not just for Him, but honestly for us. Because this peace begins to join us with Him. And because of what Jesus ultimately does, we are able to join into this important, most important of unions when we are asking Jesus for forgiveness of our sins and we become in union with God. And we have this peace, this friendship with God, this shalom, more than just a simple hello or goodbye, but it's a deeper meaning. You see, our Messiah, our Jesus, has restored the relationship that was shattered, that was lost in the garden, if we will but accept it. See, we've all sinned and fall short. And Jesus did come for us to have life and have life more abundantly. J.I. Packer writes, The peace of God is first and foremost peace with God. It is a state of affairs in which God, instead of being against us, is for us. No account of God's peace, which does not start here, can do anything other than mislead. We can't have peace in our lives and in our hearts if it doesn't begin with a true peace with God. And we have that because of what our Messiah ultimately does. 
So he restores, and, and this peace restores our relationship between God and man. And that is this way. You know, this is the horizontal path. And then you have the vertical way. Because of our Messiah, our Prince of Peace, number two, he restores what is broken between man and man. This is what the Prince of Peace does. He restores. He refreshes. He makes new. He, you know what, we've all gone through life and have relationships break and, and they've become harmed. But I'm telling you, the Prince of Peace can restore and make that fresh and anew. And there's a few passages that really begin to speak of this. The writer of Hebrews says, work at living at peace with everyone. How interesting. Work. This takes some doing on our part, which is why it says, work at living in peace with everyone. You know, let's just be real. There are those people who may rub you the wrong way. There are those people that have hurt you. I'm going to tell you right now, there are those people whom you have hurt. Because we're all human. We all make mistakes. But see, what, what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is, look, work at living at peace with everyone. And then he goes on and says, watch out. He ends this little passage by saying, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. This is what's so important. You see, we all want forgiveness extended our way, so we should be just as quick to offer forgiveness when the situation arises. Because I'm here to tell you, that situation will arise. It's all about what do we do? Do we take heed to these words? Because I always... I'm so enamored by that word, that root of bitterness. It's like, look, you've got to work at living at peace with everyone because if we don't, then a root of bitterness will grow up and poison us because that is just a, a little glimpse and a little picture of what unforgiveness begins to do. We should be living and working to be at peace with everyone because if we don't, bitterness can take root and it harms not only your relationship with that person, it will begin to harm your relationship with God. Can't have that stuff in us. Paul echoes this in Romans 12 where he writes, Do all that you can. Again, work at living at peace. Paul says here, Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Wow! What a stunning statement. You have to ask yourself when you read that, Are you doing all that you can? To live at peace. And when I look at these verses, I realize they don't really seem like suggestions. They don't seem like suggestions. This should be, as a follower of Christ, how we now live. Not just when we feel like it or when the other person treats us right or whatever. Because the mistake we often fall into is that we will accept, we will live at peace, we will forgive someone once they have cleaned up their act. Thank God he didn't put that stipulation upon us, right? He accepted us. He died for us when we were stuck in the filth and the muck of our sins. He didn't wait until we had done some sort of penance before he accepted us. He accepted us. To be really honest, he accepted you and I when we were at our worst. This is why Paul writes, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The acceptance brought life, hope, and joy to you. I mean, just think about this. Think about if we really take seriously and take heed to these words about being and trying to be at peace with everyone. Just think of being what being a peacemaker could do, not only for your life, but to somebody else. You're so quick to forgive. It begins to make a difference. And this bitter root, I even want to jump back to that. A prayer we went through, you have the Lord's Prayer. The disciples wanted Jesus to teach them how to pray. So Jesus said, okay, I will. And one of those lines, it goes back to that bitter root. He says, look, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. You see, this is where it begins. We have forgiveness. And then Jesus is even telling us, as we have, not a suggestion. It should be just how we now live. This is what I love. And I didn't want to end to this part. I even want to echo this statement one more time. As Paul says it again, he says, make allowance for each other's faults. 
I mean, think about that. Make allowances for each other's faults. Do we do that? Do we do that in our relationships? I believe we're all, we, we just, we, we treat other people and hold them to such a higher standard than we even hold ourselves. And here we see Paul saying, make allowances, forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Wow, it's right there. You must. Because again, Paul knows, the writer of Hebrews knows what happens when we don't. So we make allowances for each other's faults. We put up with their quirks and their oddities. And let's just be honest, we all have quirks and oddities. Just go ask my kids or my wife. I'm sure I have so many quirks and oddities that I don't even know it. But they put up with me, I think. But this is why Paul reminds us in this verse, again, of what Jesus did for us. We should be peacemakers. Jesus made peace for us. Now it should be something that we extend. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you have this kind of attitude, that you work at living at peace, that you, you are a peacemaker, people that don't know Jesus will begin to notice. And it just might, it just might open up a door for you to begin to share why you're able to do that. Because of what Jesus did for you. What a beautiful truth. So here we have Jesus, this Prince of Peace, came to bring us peace horizontally and vertically. And lastly, and certainly not least, our Prince of Peace came and He calms our troubled heart. He calms our troubled hearts. And we're going to look at this passage in John 14. And before I get there, I want to give you a little background in John chapter 13. This is Jesus during his last meal with his disciples. He had some rather difficult news for his followers. He, he, be, he began in this, this whole time by saying, look, one of you will betray me. One of you who's been with me throughout this whole time, one of you will betray me. And then he went on to let his followers know that he would only be with them a little while longer. That soon he would be departing. Strike two. So this is some difficult news. As you can imagine, these followers of Christ, they've been with him. They've loved him. They've seen the miracles. Now they find out one's going to betray. Then he says he's going to leave. And then before this discussion ends, he lets Peter know this rock on whom he will build his church. He says, Peter, by the way, before the rooster crows three times tonight, you will disown me. Before the rooster crows once, I'm sorry. You will, dis you will disown me three times. I got that messed up. It would have been extremely easy for these followers of Jesus to allow trouble, to allow doubt, to allow fear, to really begin to overwhelm them, to creep into their hearts, to creep into their minds. So Jesus makes this statement. Again, remember, this is a discussion. John chapter 14, Jesus didn't change chapters. They're at the same meal, the same time. Jesus says in verse 1 of chapter 14, Okay, I've said all this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't. He's like, look, don't let that in. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And when Jesus says this, he's saying this not as a suggestion, but as a command. Don't let it in. You see, trusting God would have been rather normal for the followers of Jesus because these were Jewish men. Trusting God was what they did. And he's saying, yes, you trust God, trust also in me. And what Jesus is doing is pulling their focus from the trouble, pulling it to him. He's literally saying, trust me when I'm arrested. Trust me when you see me on trial. Trust me when you see me mistreated. Trust me, even when it seems I am defeated. Trust me, I win. This is what Jesus is telling us. He's literally giving us a cure for trouble. He's giving us a cure for fear that literally may be trying to flood into our hearts. He's saying, look, I calm your troubled heart. Believe in God. Believe and trust in me. You see, Jesus goes on in this discussion. And at the end of the chapter, in verse 27, he leaves us with a gift. I don't know about you, but I love gifts. Gifts are not only fun to give, but they are fun to get. Let's just be real. And it says in verse 27, I'm leaving you with a gift. This is what I'm giving you. Peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Again, he goes back to this phrase. So don't be troubled or afraid. 
Verse 1 began, don't let your hearts be troubled. And then he wraps up this part by saying, don't be troubled or afraid. You see, this gift of peace that he's giving is based and founded on him. Now, it would have been rather common to wish peace and shalom to people in that time. But Jesus is taking it up a notch. He's not giving us any type of empty statement, but a gift. Peace from him, the Prince of Peace. And he's giving us this peace when all outward appearances would make it seem that peace is farthest from him. He knows what is about to happen, yet he speaks of peace. He knows what the next day will literally bring, yet peace is what he gives. He's literally letting us know that, that if you know and, and, and if you do the will of the Father, if you trust and believe in him, nothing can take away your peace. Nothing can take away the peace of Jesus because he's doing the will of the Father. What it becomes is like a compass in the midst of a storm that is forever pointing north. In other words, nothing can shake that peace. Jesus had that peace all throughout everything he went through. Because see, it's not based on compromise and it's not based on circumstance. It's based on him, on our trust in him. This is our Prince of Peace. And it even goes a little deeper. The writer of Isaiah, obviously Isaiah, says this, Look, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. The word keep means to guard, protect, hide, and conceal. This is what's so beautiful about this. Again, we're looking at him calming our troubled hearts. This doesn't mean that the troubles won't come, but we know and walk with the Lord through the storm. Because again, the word peace, keep in perfect peace. In Hebrew, that word is actually used twice. In other words, it's peace, peace. It's signifying its intensity. It's literally peace squared. It's being emphasized so that we get it. And this word trust, it will keep in perfect peace, peace, those who trust in him. The word trust is like a careless, reckless trust in God. One that you don't even have to think about. Like the chair that you may be sitting on right now. You did not even think about the fact that that chair was going to hold you up or not. You just did it. It was careless, reckless trust. This is the kind of trust that this verse is calling us to have in God. Think about if we do a reckless, careless trust in God. That we believe in Him no matter what. It's just like our second nature. It's totally normal. You see, think if we allow our, our minds and hearts to trust in God when the sea is choppy, not when it's just calm. You see, His peace will begin to flood your heart and it will begin to calm your troubled soul. Just like Jesus said in, in John 14, and He said it twice. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in Him. Why? Why? He is the Prince of Peace. You see, we must continue to keep our mind and our hearts focused on Him. This is why it's so important to keep God's Word in front of you, to allow God's Word to envelop you, so that when the storms of life come, and you may be in a big one, you know what? You can have peace. Why? Because of what Jesus did. You have peace with God. You have peace not only with God, but you can have peace with others. And you can have a peace that can calm your troubled soul in the midst of the most trying time because it's not based on anything, but it's based on Jesus, our Messiah, our Prince of Peace. Uh, bow your heads with me. Father, we are so honored and thankful and gracious that we have this time together to hear your word. I pray now that as we go through this last week, as we, we get through Christmas and go to Christmas, that the Prince of Peace will flood our hearts and minds, that we will focus on you. And as we celebrate the birth of our Messiah, we will see the fact that he came and he did and he does bring peace to us. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. And I pray that you all have a wonderful, blessed, peaceful Christmas. Have a great day and an awesome week.